This is a really fun episode with a dad and men's coach. Welcome to the All About Pregnancy and Birth podcast. I'm Dr. Nicole Calloway Rankins, a board certified OBGYN who's been in practice for nearly 15 years. I've had the privilege of helping over 1,000 babies into this world, and I'm here to help you be calm, confident, and empowered to have a beautiful pregnancy and birth. Quick note, this podcast is for educational purposes only and is not a substitute for medical advice. Check out the full disclaimer at drnicolerankins.com forward slash disclaimer. Now let's get to it. Well, hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of the podcast. This is episode number 101. And I am so glad as always that you are spending a bit of your time with me today. I have only had a handful of male guests on the podcast, and today I have another male guest on the podcast. Today we have David Arell on. David is an author, entrepreneur, consultant, and men's coach. He currently lives in Colorado Springs, Colorado with his wife and two children. David is really passionate about coaching men on how to more fully embrace and embody healthy masculinity, especially through the powerful modalities of partnership and parenting. His most recent work is the book, Welcome to Fatherhood, The Modern Man's Guide to Pregnancy, Childbirth, and Fatherhood. It's better known as WTF. That is not a coincidence. And we talk about that in the episode. So in WTF, David encourages men to more actively step into their important supportive roles during pregnancy, childbirth, and the fourth trimester. And the book gives detailed and practical tips and techniques on how to do this. We are going to discuss some of those tips in the episode today. I really enjoyed my conversation with David. You know how you talk to someone and you just get a good feeling about them? That's how I felt about David. I just got like a good feeling that he is coming from a genuine place of wanting to help people and just a genuine place of service. So we have a great conversation about his experience with pregnancy, birth, fatherhood, mistakes that he made, how he came to his very active and involved approach to fatherhood. Of course, we cover those tips from his book and then much, much more. You're really going to enjoy this episode. And this is one that you're going to want to listen to with your partner as well. Now, before we get into the episode, I have a quick question. Have you taken my free online class on how to make a birth plan that works? Because if you haven't, you should. This class is exactly what you need to help put you on the right path to make a birth plan that works to help you have the birth that you want. Now, a birth plan really is more than just like a checklist or a template, making your birth wishes, which is more accurate than birth plan because none of us can plan birth. But I say birth plan because that's what we all kind of say. But making a birth plan is really or needs to be a process of understanding the two most influential factors in your birth, and that is your doctor's approach to birth and your hospital's approach to birth. And in this free class, I give you questions that you need to ask in order to understand those really important two factors. And then, of course, there's tips on what to include and how to approach the process, um, how to get folks to pay attention. So tons and tons of valuable information. The course is online, on demand, completely free, offered several times a day. So you can register for it at drnicolerankins.com forward slash birth plan. All right, let's get into the episode with David Arell. So thank you so much, David, for agreeing to come onto the podcast. I'm really excited to have you here. I love that you are interested in helping uh, men be better dads and just your approach and everything just really resonated with me. Uh, thanks, Nicole. It's uh, a pleasure being here. I look forward to 
kicking some of these ideas around with you and, and talking about some of the fun things that dads can really step into these days. Yeah, yeah. So why don't you start off by telling us about yourself, your work, and your family. When I was doing some of like my background research before I have guests on, I saw you started in the restaurant space and now you're in, in coaching dads. So tell us a little bit about your journey and your family. Sure. Um, my journey has been anything but predictable from where I kind of thought it would be in, in previous chapters. Um, you mentioned the restaurant thing. I was in grad school back in San Francisco in the late 90s, and um, I got about halfway through and I noticed that most of my professors were just not happy. I was in a program for philosophy. And so I saw the writing on the wall there, and I'd been working part-time as a waiter uh, downtown at one of the nicer restaurants there. And I had so much fun there. The energy was fun. Um, people were excited. Uh, it was a it was a good vibe, and so I kind of compared the two, and I was like, "Well, this this graduate degree is definitely a career, but I don't want to spend the rest of my life doing this." So I made a left turn, uh, wrapped up uh, a quick little master's, as they say, and jumped full time into the restaurant business, and ended up moving back to Philadelphia, where I had some really good friends from college. My family's in that area, and just sort of jumped into the restaurant scene. Uh, one of the things I really loved about being uh, a frontline waiter is that I wasn't really doing anything other than helping people have the best experience that they wanted to have. I, I was lucky to work in some really nice restaurants and whether you wanted to come in for just a quick bite and go on your way, or this was a big anniversary dinner, or maybe it was a, a 10 person birthday, like I was very happy to kind of go with that flow and really do what I the best I could to help the people in front of me have the best experience they wanted to have. And that's one of the things that kind of circle back to the uh, current work with coaching the dads. Right. Um, after being in the restaurants for a while, I decided I really wanted to open up my own coffee shop. I had, I had loved the cafe vibe. I spent a lot of time in coffee shops and cafes when I was in school and grad school. And to me, it really felt like a great way to sort of line up all my values where I was serving the community. I was taking care of myself, my family. I was um, being a good steward of my little part of the economy. So back in 2007, I opened up Good Karma Cafe in Philadelphia. And uh, it was a neat little small cafe, like all organic and fair trade. And um, one of the things I really learned from that business was the importance of trying to work with the people around you to really inform and empower them to do their jobs the best way possible. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's something that I'd experienced as, as many people who are an employee experience, they kind of find places they work where they're just not really appreciated or they're, they're held accountable to things that they didn't even know they were supposed to do. So right. to me, that was a big learning opportunity and a chance to kind of embody a much more healthy and progressive um, you know, boss role uh, with the with the team around me and with in my community as well. Um, I met my wife one day at a yoga studio. Literally, we I had a little moped I was riding at the time, and uh, she had one too. And we hadn't seen each other before. And she pulled up across the street on her moped, and uh, I looked over. And clear as day, I heard a voice in my head say, "There she is." Oh wow! And it's funny because <laughs> at the time I was like. You know, really just kind of doing my bachelor thing. I was busy with the shops. I was kind of right. running at two stores at that point. And I kind of like checked myself. I was like, I, I don't have time for a relationship right now. I'm 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 busy, you know. But sure enough, a few months later we just started talking more and really connected. And up to that point, I had never really viewed myself as a guy who's gonna have kids or a dad kind of material. I was traveling, I kind of, you know living a, a fun life, being a single guy in, in Philadelphia and just busy doing my thing. And, and my world like literally switched channels that day. Right. And um, I remember one time, one night on the couch, my wife, and at the time we were dating, she's like, you know, I think I really might be okay having kids with you. And I was like, okay, babe, sounds great to me. <laughs> You know, later we laughed about how she was so sort of like taken aback by my like non-enthusiastic response. Right. And I was like, oh, babe, I, I knew the minute I met you, I wanted to have kids with you. Like I was already there. I just wasn't trying to, to rush you there. So right, right, right. like my little dad, uh, my dad gene kicked on then. 
And um, we uh, end up selling the business. We moved to Omaha. My wife is a pediatric nurse practitioner. She's uh-huh. in the Air Force. And um, the plan was for us to start a family. And literally, you know, I think we hadn't even unpacked all of our moving boxes and we found out we were expecting. And I was just so excited. I was like, okay, you know, I'm like, I'm ready. I'm ready to do this. I wanted to be a dad. I was committed to um, being a stay-at-home dad because I'd just kind of gotten out of the business world of just running around crazy every day, all day. Right. So I was ready, but you know, I thought I was ready. (laughs) (laughs) And you're certainly going to tell us about some of that as, as well. So at what point did you end up like deciding that you, that you were going to be intentional about actually coaching dads? Well, I think so with our first pregnancy, I, I thought I was doing all the quote unquote, the right things. Like we went to, uh, we did a birth class together, the Bradley birth class method, um, the base was sponsoring another, um, birth class type event called circling for, for pregnant families. Um, I read the books. I kind of thought I was doing so many things right. Um, and going through that pregnancy and especially going through, um, childbirth and then that, you know, that fourth trimester back home, I had so many moments where I look back and I was like, oh man, I really could have done that a lot better. <laughs> gotcha. You know? I thought I was there, but none of the books mentioned this. And in hindsight, it just became clear that I would have had a much easier, or not as easier, but like a richer experience had I understood something differently previously than I did. And only after kind of like going through it um, and having different experiences was I able to look back and be like, wow, if somebody had told me that then, Uh this would have been so much better. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Don't we all have that hindsight sometimes? Mm -hmm. It's always 2020. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but something still like pushed you to make that leap into like writing and workshops and we'll get into some of your work. So it's just always interesting to me, like what causes people to, to take that next step, like, or listen to that voice that's, that's, pulling you there? Well, I, th- I think um, one of the things that motivates me, and I think a lot of people that go into the birth space in some sort of professional capacity have a similar motivation where they had either a fantastic experience with really powerful people helping them along the way, and or they had some really challenging experiences that they came out the other side of feeling like they'd been I don't know if let down is the right word, but they hadn't really been helped along in what could have been a much easier process. Do you consider yourself a dad coach, so to speak? Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I think that, uh, I think that's an accurate label, but I would, I would like to have, um, I'd like to get a little bit more feedback on some of the, uh, some of the work I've been putting out there before I could really honestly embrace that. Like, I think I'm a dad, I'm a dad coach in, uh, in development here. The job's never done, but my, uh, my aspirations and intentions are in that direction for sure. Gotcha. 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 So let's talk a little bit about like your experience as a father, uh, because obviously that, that informs your work. So it sounds like you were excited about becoming a father. Is that fair to say for both of your children? Was it different for uh, each of your children? No, I, I was I was probably more excited with the first just because of the novelty and the sort of unknown. And I think, like I mentioned in the book, most dads to be are if you ask them what they're excited about, they'll start talking about things like, oh, teaching my kid to ride a bike or going fishing, or it's like the kid pops out at, and they're four years old magically. So, <laughs> <laughs> so many dads are, are, that's part of the uh, programming that, that us dads kind of like come built in with, I think. And, um, so with the first pregnancy, I had, you know, I had some of those visions in my mind and, um, you know, being, being a stay home dad through that first trimester or that fourth trimester back home, um, those first three months, you know, really kind of quickly cleared my eyes of those illusions of playing catch and playing softball and riding bikes and got right back into warming up bottles and Mm -hmm. shift sleeping and changing diapers and, and doing all the things. So once I made that first adjustment to like, Oh, that, that, that other thing with bicycles is years away. And this is what's happening now. Um, once I made that shift, I was able to kind of like, 
be re-enthused about like what it means to be be that be a dad and be a partner to my wife and 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 uh, you know a caregiver to my brand new infant. Um, I think the second the second pregnancy and the second childbirth experience was so much easier for for all the reasons. But I think for me, I had I had that experience of going through it before. Um, I also had the experience of seeing my wife go through it before, which was really powerful for me. Um, and I can get into that a little bit later, but yeah. And then, and then having our second baby, I mean, I was, I felt calmer. I felt, you know, I knew what I was doing more anyway. Um, and I felt I'd been doing the work on the welcome to father stuff. So I'd been doing a lot of research and talking to people and doing my workshop. So I had more than just my experience to kind of draw from. So the second one, I felt so much more, uh, balanced and like positioned to be, the best version of myself I could be where I'd already kind of done the learning on the fly that comes with all first pregnancies and childbirths, uh, that first go around. So I think I was definitely a much better partner the second go around. Um, and I guess it's still to be determined if I'm being a better dad or not. <laughs> <laughs> and how far apart are your children? Uh, just 22 months. So just under two years. Oh, wow. Okay. 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 So you didn't have like a whole ton of time to kind of like, you know, create a different experience or, you know, change things the second time around. So it sounds like you went all in with like making it the best version for yourself that you could. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was a rolling, uh, learning environment with going through, um, you know, our, Justin, our firstborn, um, you know, breastfed, breastfed all the way up through, uh, Jen getting pregnant with our second and, um, you know, transitioning, uh, to solid foods and, you know, all of those things as she was already going into, uh, another pregnancy. Uh, it was just sort of like a, a rolling education for all three of us. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so what is one of the things that you feel like is a mistake that informs your work before we start talking about your work? Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes I made going the first round is I just really was, I, I didn't, fully appreciate how important and the big of a deal um, pregnancy is, well, was my wife and, and is for almost all of the women I speak with. Like mm -hmm. it, and I, I, I le this is like right in the first chapter of the book, like, yep. Hey guys, like pregnancy is literally the, probably the biggest deal ever for mama, bigger than weddings and graduation and promotions. Like this is a very, powerful life-changing experience and mm -hmm. i don't want to like dip too dip my toes too deep into the, like the spirituality side of things but this is like a transformative process sure. it's uh you know all of we all got here from from our moms and you know in different cultures and times past like it was the transition from maidenhood to motherhood was like a huge rite of passage and for us guys our, our kind of our native response is it's sort of something happening, you know, quote unquote, over there with mama. And we're just sort of like, okay, yeah, sure. You know, if you want some ice cream and pickles or, you know, <laughs> I'll, you want me to lift something heavy? Like, yeah, I'm your guy. But otherwise I really, I, I just don't know what I'm doing over here or what I'm supposed to be doing. Right, right, right. And so I think, you know, I was definitely not as helpful and supportive the first go around as I could have been. Um, but from the lessons I learned and the research I was doing and, um, you know, I really felt so much more connected to my wife's process that second time around. One of the taglines I kind of hit on is uh, better connected and better prepared and better connected to mama is the first one of those two for a reason. Like that's really something I think most guys could reevaluate. It's like, how connected are you to mama and her journey right now? Cause right. it's a really big deal and you can't just be on the side sort of waiting to be tasked with something you want to you want to step in there right away into that emotional space and be that teammate and partner she needs you know yep yep absolutely absolutely so you take what what, what many would consider like a more progressive and active approach to fatherhood which isn't always the case so how did you come to this philosophy and approach um i think i think one of the things that was helpful for my circumstance is that I was a little bit older. I was in my forties when we had our, uh, first pregnancy and 
I'd already had an opportunity to sort of, you know, be quote unquote successful in the business world. So I was really energetically committed a hundred percent to the parenthood journey. Mm -hmm. And like, I was, I was enthusiastic about getting a cool baby wearing contraption and <laughs> getting my dad bag. And, uh, I was, I was ready. Like I was, I wanted to be there. I wanted to be, um, a full, like a full teammate, uh, to my wife, but also like a full parent for my kid. I, I was lucky growing up. My dad was a, was a great dad and I don't have any like, you know, large complaints about that process, but I, th I think it was a different opportunity now for us guys these days to really embrace that role as, as, as much and as deeply as we want to. And, and I was all in on that. So I think, so there were some circumstances there that were favorable for me, but also just, you know, I've always kind of leaned more towards like that progressive end of the spectrum, like with my coffee shop and organic and fair trade and, and getting into the dad stuff like, Hey man, let, let's get in there. Let's do this. Let's make things better for ourselves, but everybody else also. So I wanted to be, you know, kind of an example, like, Hey, you know, it's not, it's not feminine or whatever the critique would be to wear your baby or to be changing your baby's diaper. There's no such thing as quote unquote women's work or let the women do that. Even though it may have been true for certain places and times in the past, like it's all everybody's work. It's a team effort. Let's all jump in. Exactly. 100%. 100%. I'm grateful that I'm married to someone. My husband Falcon is the same way. So, um, it's just, it's just, it's just great. So have you ever got any pushback though? Like, what are you doing, man? Like, this is lame. Or like, have you ever had anybody say anything like that to you? And if so, um, how'd you overcome it? Or what do you tell other dads who like say that they've experienced that? Well, I think one of the the great sort of mellowing elements I've experienced through this process is to be a little less sort of like prickly about that kind of stuff. Mm. I remember it was a uh, we had Justin in the in summertime it was in August, and then one day in September I, I had him strapped to me and we were going out for a walk in our neighborhood, and this dear sweet nice little old lady with her little dog is walking towards me. And she's looking at me and I can just tell by the look, she's confused as to why she's, she's wondering where mama is, you know? Right. And I'm like, ah, oh, here we go. You right, know? Right. Right. And, uh, and she passes me and I pass her and I kind of like force a smile at her. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm already feeling like a little defensive. And, uh, she turns around in this like really thick European accent. She's like, oh, you, uh, stay, you homestay dad. And I'm trying to feign like a German accent. Sorry for that. Um, but I was, but then I, re I was like, yes. And she's like, oh, good job, good job. She gave me like two big thumbs up. And it was so funny. I mean, I've had so many moments where I was like anticipating a circumstance to go one way and it went another. Right. And that was one of those. And it was so funny. I was like, ah, this is good. This this clearly a member of the older generation, maybe from mm -hmm. a more traditional mindset, is fully supportive of me being a dad walking around with my, with, you know, my baby on my chest. And I got a little bottle sticking out of my back pocket in case he wakes up and is hungry. And so I, I haven't felt a lot of explicit resistance, but I, I have worked with guys who've told me like, Hey man, like, you know, my dad is really telling me not to get too bogged down in this diaper stuff and telling me just to go focus on bringing home the bacon and let my wife cook it up. And, and I'm not really down with that anymore. And to those guys, I'm like, yeah, I get it. I, I've I've seen that story. Some of our more traditional, um, you know, mindsets around what men are supposed to be doing and women are supposed to be doing. I don't think a lot of that really holds anymore. So to those guys, I would say, look, man, it, don't really worry about what your friends and family members, or even if it's elder members in your community that you generally respect and honor and trust a lot for their opinion and advice. If they're trying to like check you on this particular thing, you know, don't worry about that. Your focus is on mama and your and your baby. Like, you know, parenthood starts with that positive pregnancy test is something I tell everybody. So really focus on that and take care of your team. That's you, your mama, I mean, your you know, mama and your your partner, your wife, and and focus on that baby that's coming out soon. And that's who you really gotta that's whose respect and honor and opinion is really gonna matter down the road. Not not Uncle Fred over there wagging mm -hmm. his finger about why you changing a diaper and let the women do it, you right, know? So. Right, right, right. I love that. I love that. So what inspired you to write your book, Welcome to Fatherhood? And I read, I, I will 
fully confess, I didn't read the entire thing. I read parts of it. And what I read was very great. And my assistant, Kelly, however, read the entire thing and she loved it. So, <laughs> um, so what inspired you to write the book, Welcome to Fatherhood? Well, I was, I was doing some workshops back in Omaha. Um, I partnered up with a lovely friend of ours. Uh, we were doing a couple's workshops called Bump to Baby. And I was doing the uh, Welcome to Fatherhood as sort of like a breakout session for just the dads. Uh -huh. And I think so much of the challenge that, you know, somebody like, like me and, and many of the mamas that out there face also is that the dads, like the biggest complaint I hear is that dad just doesn't quite seem to get it. He's mm -hmm. like, he's not really plugged into what's going on. He seems like, I know he wants to be helpful and he always asks what he can do, but he just seems like really disconnected from the process and, and, and what would be more, you know, quote unquote, helpful and supportive. And so in doing those workshops, I was able to really kind of like fine tune some of the specific big ideas and dad tips are in the book. But I, I, you know, it's one of those things like the people who need to go to the workshop, these expectant dads don't know that they're the ones who need to be there. And, you know, mama's got her hands full reading up all of her own stuff. And the last thing she needs is to have one more thing. She's kind of like, you know, kicking him in the pants about like, hey, maybe you should take this workshop. So I looked at the book as an option that was a lot, I think it was a great way for me to get really much more clear about what I thought was important, mm -hmm. but also it's just an easier access point, you know, for a guy who's a little bit resistant or a little bit unsure you know, walking into a workshop with some random dude, me at the front and these other guys, he doesn't know it's, it's a hard space for these guys to be vulnerable and be open to, uh, learning and being more receptive about some of these different topics. But I think with a book format, it's a lot easier and I don't say safer cause that seems to like, you know, overstate the risk, but it's a lot easier for a guy to kind of sit down when he's got some time to himself and kind of flip through it and see if it, if, if a book is going to speak to him in a way that's going to resonate with him or if it's going to like get his attention. And also for the mamas out there, I think it's a lot easier for a mama just to kind of like, if she, if she thinks her, her guy could use a little boost to, you know, to pass him a book or a link to an article, as opposed to like trying to cajole him to signing up for a workshop. I mean, a workshop is a big commitment, energetically speaking. Whereas a book is a pretty simple thing to get to, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, the book is very well written. It's like an, an easy, straightforward read and the way you organize it also is great. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you refer to the book as WTF, which is shorthand for another expression. <laughs> is that intentional <laughs> after having done a little bit of <laughs> research and reading about you? I think it was. <laughs> Well, Nicole, I want to keep things PG here on the show, um, but I'll confess the uh, the alternative uh, use of WTF uh, probably happened to me as a thought about a thousand times <laughs> between finding out we were pregnant with Justin that first go around right. and then that whole pregnancy, childbirth and that first, you know, three months of maternity leave afterwards. You know, I had many a moment where I was you know, I'm doing my best. I'm trying. I'm like, I'm trying to find a way to make something work. And eventually I kind of found a, a, a you know, quote unquote solution. And then it became so obvious. I'm like, you know, WTF, why did anybody tell me this? Like, right. this is going to save me, you know, hours of, of struggle and whatnot. And, you know, one of my, one of my favorite definitions or my favorite examples of this is the, uh, is the code words dad tip. So something I talk about in there is that, my wife and I figured out the system of using code words for green light, yellow light, and red light. And uh -huh. we went with, uh, we went with, uh, you know, refrigerator objects. We had an avocado for green, lemon for yellow, and tomato for red. Okay. And, you know, because a good, a, a certain situation came up. We were at a, uh, we're at this ice cream shop. And my wife is like 40 weeks and two. She's 40 and two pregnant, like, quote, unquote, overdue. It's August. She's hot. She's mad. She wants to have the baby. She's stressed out. She's anxious. And so we're waiting for ice cream. And this older couple comes up behind us. And the lady, without even skipping a beat, is like, oh, my, I hope you don't have that baby right here. Oh. And I start cracking up because I thought that was kind of funny. But right. I looked at Jen. And Jen, like, I could see she literally almost started to cry. And I was like, oh, new plan, new plan. Oh. Not laughing. Right. And so I was like, oh, oh, yeah, cohorts. I was like, hey, babe. Why don't you grab a seat on that bench across the street while I wait and get the ice cream for us? I know we need tomatoes, 
but can you work up the rest of the our, a good grocery list for us? And she kind of glared at me because at first she thought I was like trying to put her in timeout or you know something. And then she realized I was like giving her an easy out from having to stand there in this hot sunshine with these old people that were kind of like, you know, innocently yet, you know, pointedly sort of like talking about her pregnancy. Right. And she was like, ah, oh. and I could just see her relax. She's like, that's a great idea, babe. Thank you. Oh, nice. And she went and sat across the street. Nobody talked to her. Nobody was, you know, remarking on her belly or anything. And that code words thing, we used them a bunch of different times. And it's, you know, I felt it made my life a lot easier because it took sort of that guesswork out of like, oh, you know, things change rapidly for mamas, especially later in the pregnancy with how they're feeling, what mm -hmm. they want to do. And mm -hmm. if I'm on the plan that we had 10 minutes ago, that may not be the right plan anymore. So we were able to use those code words back and forth to great effect. And that was something I was like, you know, I wish somebody would have told me that because we could have, we could have been doing this for months now and had so much easier... Uh, time with some of these social situations or out to dinner or getting tired or what any number of things could have been so much easier if she just gave me a code word rather than me trying to guess or her like wanting to go home but not wanting to be a party pooper and you know some of those different challenging situations you can find yourself in especially socially speaking where having that code word really made a difference for us absolutely absolutely so why don't we get into a couple more tips in in the book what would you say are your three favorite dad tips from the book Ooh, I think um, I think one of my favorite ones really is is happens right off the bat, and that's kind of one of more of the informed side of the equation on the on the big ideas, which is uh, you know women become mothers when they find out they are pregnant, mm -hmm. while dads don't become dads until after the baby's born, mm. and that that may be historically you know more true than false, but I think most guys are unaware of that of that sort of differentiation between their experiences. So I think who guys who really understand that, like, look, that parenthood starts with that positive pregnancy test. Mama's already tasked with eating right, sleeping right, worrying about her vitamins and her and avoiding sushi and which cheese to eat. And right. she's got a lot of like, she's taking care of that baby right now. And you need to be better connected to her in that process and not be like, oh, hey, babe, I'm going to go grab a beer. I know you're not drinking, but I'm going to I'm going to sit over here and have a beer and relax while you're stressing about the about what the baby's doing. Like, that's not a that's not a good look, you know, so <laughs> I think dads need to plug right into that sort of like um, that that reality right away would be something I would say. Definitely start with that. Um Another big one, especially in these in these COVID times where there's a lot of limitations on who can be present right. uh, during childbirth, and you might have previously been able to have like you know a doula and a birth photographer and your mom and her mom, and mm -hmm. but now it may just be just one person, which is going to be you, Dad. Yeah. So the um, big idea number ten is about that mantra of be attentive, be calm, and be competent, mm. like. That is the main mantra for you as the dad, the, the support partner, and maybe the only partner in the room with her during, you know, it could, it could be an extensive and, you know, tricky, challenging, energy, energetic childbirth experience. And it's just you and mama. So, yes, you know, I, I kind of get into some of the specific things, like what does that look like, whether you're in the transition or um, earlier labor or whatnot, but still like that, that energy you put out as dad of being attentive to mama, being calm, regardless of what's going on, and being competent with whether it's, you know, helping her shift positions or massaging her back or getting her a sip of water or whatever it is, like, right. where you're there for her as her person to count on um, is, is extremely important and a very powerful part of that birth story and that relationship going forward. Uh, so those two, I think, would be like, right off the bat, jump right in. And especially in these COVID times, if you're going to be the guy, the only person there, make sure you take that responsibility. You know, you know, I don't want to say seriously in the sense of like somber, but like that's a lot of responsibility on you. So definitely don't be the guy that thought he was going to kind of figure it out when he got there and yes. was just left in the dust. You yes. know, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. You got one more for us? You think? Sure. Um, I think. One of my favorite ones is uh, is dad tip number seven, where I'm pretty I'm pretty strong on this one, which is dude hire a doula. Mm. A lot of you know, a lot of what I talk about is sort of like suggestions or like, hey man, you might want to think about this. Right. But this one, I'm like crystal clear on. I'm like, please hire a doula. A doula 
um, is, is your wingman from heaven is the way I phrase it in the book. Like <laughs> I, I know you're a, you're a big fan of doulas also. I am. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important for guys to understand that this doula is, is a birth professional, not medically trained. She's more of like a psychological comfort coach type person. Um, but something, somebody, your partner, your wife can really look to as a experienced big sister kind of person that can really be a source of, of comfort as well as, um, uh, expertise on like shifting positions or, or like a trusted helper that can be holding, you know, or her hand on the other side of the bed while you're on your side. Um, and honestly for guys, like for me, my duel, the duel we had was a lifesaver for me. Like, you know, one of the big challenges I faced is the, you know, we, we were committed to doing kind of a natural ish, uh, childbirth as possible. My, my wife uh -huh. was committed to going, you know, no meds and as kind of like low intervention as possible. And we had a great OB. Uh, one of the doctors she worked with, Kevin Sisk is just awesome. He's a, he's a, uh, a world famous baby catcher as all his, uh, all his moms refer to him as, <laughs> um, but he was like super, you know, supportive to that process. But, you know, I was really worried because like, you know, I tease Jen sometimes, but if she stubs her toe, she goes down like she got shot, like a sack of potatoes <laughs> and she's screaming on the floor. And I'm like, oh my God. And I, honestly, I was terrified. So I had to pull the duel aside. Like, you know, we're, we're 38 weeks. We're getting close. I'm like, okay, I got to confess. She can't, she can't like stub a toe without freaking out and right. we're, we're trying to go natural childbirth. Like I really want to be supportive and like encouraging, but the part of my brain that connects to reality is like, dude, she is not going to be able to push a watermelon out the size of a lemon. It's just not going to work. Like this is, this is, there's no basis for me to be confident other than just wanting to be connected. And my doula was like, David, I get it. Don't worry. Childbirth is a whole different realm of experience. And I, I have a ton of confidence in Jen and all the confidence you want to put in her is well placed. She's going to be able to do it and I'll be right there by your side. And I was like, oh, good. Thank God. Because I was not going to be really comfortable being, um, you know, being there and seeing her going through some of those more challenging moments. Right. And like wondering if, you know, do I need, you know, do I need to be the one to be like, hey, you know, do you, is this too much pain? Like it really just kind of. I felt so comforted knowing that, that I had that doula as my wingman through the process too, where I could kind of connect with her and check in with her when I was worried about what was going on. And, um, and ultimately like, you know, she was, Barb was just fantastic and having her there allowed both Jen and I to relax and, you know, that, that relaxing as much, you know, given the circumstances, sure. um, but anything you can do to counter that anxiety on all parties is just a huge win for everybody. So having that doula there, it was like, definitely dude, hire doula, not maybe a hire doula or think about a doula, but if you do one thing, hire a doula. I, that is really interesting. Your perspective, because, you know, we know that doulas provide physical and emotional, emotional support for, for moms, but I never thought about the fact, and it kind of brings up like, even though you're not physically going through the pregnancy, you still have concerns and you still have like, um, you know, questions and things like that. So it's a great outlet for you to get some of your own like emotional needs taken care of as well. And that's what a good doula will do for you. Absolutely. And one other thing I want to add to that, Nicole, is that so much of what us guys tend to hear going through the pregnancy is that it's kind of our job to be the protector and sort of, especially during some of the more um, intense parts of childbirth where mama may be somewhat disconnected from the room and, you know, you need to be her advocate and her sort of uh, protector. And, you know, that's, that's a lot of responsibility. Yeah. Like I'm not, I'm not a trained OB. Like I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be like watching out for and right. like when I should sort of like step in or when I should stand back and let the professionals do their job, you know? So, you know, having that doula there as somebody who's been through, you know, many births, depending on your own interviewing process, you could, you could have like a minimum of 10 or 20 or 50, whatever you want for your doula's qualification, but somebody who's kind of been there and, and, and done that and got the t-shirt sort of thing really, allowed me to relax. Like during our first childbirth, I was, I was so stressed out, Nicole, like my I'm legs sure. were tight right. and I was like, Jen had like, you know, 
she was a little bit loud at times and she was screaming my hand and she's like, I can't hear anybody. I can't hear anybody. And they're trying to put an oxygen mask on her face and it was making her claustrophobic. And I'm like, I'm trying to like be attentive to her, but also like, when do I need to like tell this nurse to stand back or whatever? Right. And so I look back at Barb and Barb just kind of looked at me and she shook her head. She nodded and smiled at me. She's like, you're fine. You got this. And I finally was able just to not worry about what was happening in the room and only focus on Jen and be mm. present for her and like look into her eyes and say, you got this baby, the baby's almost here. I can't wait to meet our baby. You're amazing and awesome. And like really be in sync with her and not worry about what's going on in the room because the doula had my back. Like that was critical to the rest of that experience for me being able to relax into my proper role, which is supporting my, my wife during that moment, you know? Oh, that is absolutely love it. Lovely. I love that. I love that. So I know that in addition to the book, you do workshops, you do one-to-one -one coaching. And at the end, I'll, you know, you can tell everybody where they can find you, but I'm curious in all of your work, what is one of the like most memorable moments that you've had in working with expectant dads or for yourself? Sure. Great question. Um, I think one of the most powerful moments I have is one of the, one of the first couple workshops I was doing. Um, it was a small workshop. There's four guys there. And uh, one of the guys came in just a few minutes late and you could sort of tell he was, he was like kind of annoyed. He even had to be there. And as he, we sat down, we did introductions and he mentioned that he was there because his wife had signed him up for it. And um, I could, you know, you could see he was, he was checking a box mm -hmm. and not like open eyed and like having his pen and his paper ready. But as the workshop went on, I could, I could see he was sort of like becoming more attentive. And um, as we were telling our stories, he mentioned he was working for a firm and he was a young guy, but had been real successful at his firm and been really committed to putting the time and hours in to kind of prove to his bosses that he was somebody that they could count on. Like being, being somebody to be that he could, that could be counted on was clearly like a big part of his identity and his priorities. Right. Um, so we got through the workshop and, uh, you know, the, this was one of like the two hour version. So it was pretty condensed and like bing, boom, 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 like kind of rolling through without too much time for, uh, processing and sharing, like, how did that land for you? You know? So the workshop wraps up and I'm packing up, you know, my little, my, my papers and my materials, my computer and screen and whatnot. And I go outside and he's out, he's out front. And I was like, Oh, Hey, uh, what's up, man? And he's like, listen, David, I have to tell you that I am so glad I came here today. Like coming into this, I mentioned my wife signed me up and I, I was looking at my job as being the provider. Like I was planning on missing the least amount of time of work as possible to get back to work, to kind of keep on trying to make partner. And I, that's how I was going to take care of my family was, was be in that provider role. And after hearing, you know, some of the stories you talk about in the workshop, and your experience of fatherhood. And I literally felt a change take place inside where I realized that being a great dad, which was my goal, was much more about simply being present and showing up for my family and much less about like making partner or putting in, you know, 70 billable hours a week. And mm -hmm. he's like, I, I, I cannot wait to go home and tell my wife about how much more I'm focused on her, our pregnancy, and our baby, because being a protector, I mean, being a provider and a protector is one thing, but being a parent is, is a much more important role. And he was literally had some like tears come in his eyes and I started tearing up too. Cause I was like, wow, you know, like here I am doing my, you know, doing my shtick and talking about some of the things that were powerful for me with no real like hope right. that I was actually going to have that big of an impact, but just feeling connected to him and so glad that he had that insight and that, that realization that day rather than it being five or 10 or 15 years down the road. And he's a partner, but he's a, he's got an empty house to come home to because his family broke up because he was never there and he missed yeah. birthdays and braces and all those fun things. So just to see that sort of sea change in him after a two hour workshop, I was like, wow, yeah. that was, that's really validating for, for me and the work that I'm putting out there that it can have that kind of impact on somebody. For sure. That is a really beautiful, beautiful story. And, and, and I can imagine you carrying that with you all, all the time. And, and also it's not just about like, it's not 
so much that, and I guess I'm paraphrasing for those of us who like do this because we just love the work. Like you, it's not, you're doing it for you. It's the fact that you see this thing in this other person. It's not like your accolades, but you really made a difference in someone else's like long-term life and maybe their relationship with their family. And that just feels really good. Ah, totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So on the flip side, what's the frustrating thing or part about your work? Oh, um, I think, well, I don't want to, I don't want to sound too critical here of sort of like the big, bad society in quotes, but I really feel that many of the current systems in place around pregnancy and childbirth and even new parenthood just aren't as good as they could be. That's true. I mean, even many new moms get little, if any maternity leave, and it's even less for, for new dads out mm -hmm. there. And and it's kind of a shame because I think, you know, we've made a lot of progress. Like I know for when I was born, my dad was not allowed in the delivery room and he was only allowed to visit me for a half hour uh, a day under strict nurse supervision. And that was it. And like, we're so far past that, but still I feel we have, we have there's so much potential just sort of like waiting for us to step further into that birth space and bring dads in more support mamas. Like so many mamas are not getting that support that they need from their, uh, you know, their caregivers around them, especially that postpartum period has become more of a focus of mine. Like, you know, they have the baby and they go home and, and, and then what, you know, yeah. the, all that attention they were getting just sort of disappears. Right. And, you know, people talk a lot about postpartum, uh, depression, but postpartum anxiety is a big thing also. And it's really easy to be overwhelmed as, as new parents, mamas and dads with everything that's going on and just kind of not having the social systems around you to fully support that and really invest in those, those, you know, those first few months and beyond of, of every new child's life. So I get kind of frustrated about the pace of that change, but you know, I'm always kind of like a rare and to go kind of guy. So I'm, I'm used to being a little bit frustrating with frustrated with things moving sl more slowly around me than I would like them to do, but yeah, it does get me yeah. sometimes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So then last thing, what's your favorite piece of advice that you would give to expectant dads? Well, I'd say first of all, um, remember to have fun on this journey and enjoy each phase that you're on it together. Like Sure, there's a lot of serious things, and there's you know it's a it's a it's a an important topic, but that doesn't mean there can't be lots of moments of fun and levity and really connecting in with mama, and enjoying that journey together. Like that first pregnancy and first childbirth is never going to be repeated. Uh, you may have other children and other pregnancies, but this first one is going to be so unique experientially that I would say, you know, drink deep from that cup. Like really get in there and have fun with it. Um, but I think the, the a more specific thing for the dads would be just to put a lot of your focus and attention into mama and really try to connect with her. Like this is, this may be, many mamas experience this pregnancy as a very, you know, very profoundly transformative time period. And you want to be, you want to be as present for that as possible because it's such a powerful uh, time of her life and bringing a new baby into the world. And like, you really don't, you don't want to look back on that with too many things of, I wish I did this differently. Right. So really just jump right in and really get in there. Cause like I said before, parenthood starts with that positive pregnancy test and the time to kind of be a good teammate isn't quote unquote, when the baby gets here, it's, you know, it's yesterday. So jump right in yeah. and, and really embrace that role and kind of really own it, you know? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, David. You have provided such great information. I know that both moms and dads are going to find this episode really, really useful. So tell us where can people find you? Where can people grab your book? Tell us all those things. Sure. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me on today, Nicole. It's been a great pleasure to to get into these ideas and and really kind of explore bringing more attention and help to those dads out there that are looking for a little extra guidance. Um, but you can find me online at uh, just www.welcometofatherhood.com. I got some excerpts from the book on there. All kinds of resources are on there for free. Uh, links to articles about everything from ultrasounds to birth plans and go bags, all kinds of fun stuff that you may or may not have already looked into. Um, you can email me directly uh, to david at welcometofatherhood.com. 
And the book's available on Amazon. You can get it in either paperback or Kindle. I'm still getting the final touches on the audio book. I know a lot of guys uh, really enjoy that format for throwing in the car on their way to and from work or whatnot. And finally, I'm not very active on Facebook, but I am on there. Um, you can find me on there too. I'm always happy to connect any way you guys want to reach out. And mamas too. Like I'm always happy to kind of kind of chat to the moms a little bit and be like, hey, you know, let, tell me what's going on with data and I can maybe... I can maybe give you a, a couple of tips to help get him more in sync with where you are. So yeah. anybody feel free to reach out. Well, thank you. And are you still doing like one? I know COVID has like turned the world upside down, but are you still doing like one-to-one -one virtual coaching or workshops or anything like that? Yeah. The COVID thing is really um, throwing a wrench in a pretty much, I mean, everybody has their own yeah. versions of that, but I took some time off in the workshops to write the book, um, but I'm definitely back into that. I'm in some conversation um, with a few different groups about putting together a virtual workshop that is uh, like a series of six one hour you know, presentations where I kind of work my way through the book and um, building out what that might look like and how to break it down. So I don't have anything currently on offer, uh, but I'm always happy to do a one-on-one -on -one coaching via Zoom. Um, I had a, a guy contact me a little while back who was, uh, th they were in their like 39th week of pregnancy and he had a realization of how totally unprepared and just out of touch he was. And he was literally panicking. Um, so we had a little two hour conversation and kind of caught up some of the basics and brought him up to speed and gave him some good tools he really felt uh, much better about. So I'm always happy to help the dads out there. You know, it's it's in the best interest of everybody to have dads a little bit more connected to the to mama's journey and prepared for what's coming up. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, again, thank you, David, so much for being here. I so appreciate your time. Thanks, Nicole. Thanks for all the uh, good work you put out there too. I really appreciate another quality opinion out there. Thank you so much. Thanks. So didn't you enjoy that episode? Wasn't that lovely? As I said, I just got a good feeling from David and his like energy coming through that he's just coming from a place of really wanting to help people and wanting to be of service. So I um, enjoyed the episode. And we actually talked about having him come back on and talk about more of a focus on the postpartum period. So stay tuned for that. All right. Now, after every episode, I do something called Nicole's Notes, where I talk about my top three or four takeaways from the episode and the conversation. So here are my Nicole's Notes from my conversation with David. Number one is that dads can and should be involved in pregnancy, birth, and caring for baby. I know this goes without saying, but it's going to be said again. Like dads can, can and should be involved. We, we have come a long way in terms of where our society is, but we still have some ways to go and things like paternity leave and um, just, just like not looking at dads as babysitters, but looking at dads as parents. Now, I know one of the ways that this has been a bit of a struggle recently that I've heard lots of folks say in my course community is that dads have been having a hard time connecting to pregnancy because they haven't been permitted to go to the prenatal appointments. And that's because of COVID. And that's been a disappointment. I can't say that I have like a big answer or response for that other than you can certainly have dad on the phone. You can certainly have dad like via video chat, but I know that it's really, really, really tough. Um, and then those type of things don't make it, you know, easy for dads to be involved, but in general, dads can and should be involved in pregnancy, birth, and that postpartum period and caring for baby. Number two, I love the code words, like the signals that you need some support during your pregnancy or just in general. So I thought that those code words were really like helpful and an easy way and things that you could do to kind of communicate and have that language when you need support, need to be bailed out of a situation that can work, not just in social situations, but if you're like in the middle of a phone call that you need to get out of, or if you know, you have some visitors, those limited visitors that you have with parents after, after birth, just kind of navigating those situations. So I really thought that code word analogy was pretty cute. And then the last thing is I will echo hiring a doula. Doulas provide physical and emotional support during labor, and they're just a great investment and they help improve outcomes. They help increase vaginal birth rates, decrease pain medication, shorten labor. So doulas are a good thing overall. And as David mentioned, there is support for both mom and partner. 
So um, always a good investment. I tell people that you can put that on your um, baby list registry or on your registry and you can use baby list. I'm not affiliated with baby list at all, but baby list allows you to put anything you want on a baby registry. So that's a great way to ask for like contributions to a doula, either to have both during pregnancy and the postpartum period or, or just even during birth. Now, one of the things I cover in uh, the birth preparation course, that is my online childbirth education class that ensures you are calm, confident, and empowered to have a beautiful birth. In that course, I provide a whole list of questions to interview a doula and what to look for and what not to look for, all of those good, great things. So of course, there's more to it in the course than that, but that's one of the the features and highlights that folks love. And if you want to learn more about the birth preparation course, then do check that out at drnicolerankins.com forward slash enroll. All right. So there you have it. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast. If you're not already subscribed in Apple podcasts, Google play, Spotify, wherever you're listening to me right now. And, uh, I would really appreciate it if you leave a review, especially in Apple podcast. And when you leave those reviews, they're really important to help the show grow. They're really important to help other women find the show. And then I also do shout outs from time to time from those reviews. So I do so certainly appreciate you taking your time to leave those. And as I mentioned earlier, do check out that free online class, how to make a birth plan that works so that you can have the beautiful birth that you want. That free class is at drnicolerankins.com forward slash birth plan. All right. So that is it for this episode. Do come on back next week. And until then, I wish you a beautiful pregnancy and birth. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the All About Pregnancy and Birth podcast. Head to my website, drnicolerankins.com to get even more great information, including free downloadable resources on how to manage pain and labor and warning signs to look out for after birth. You'll also find information on my free online class on how to make a birth plan that works, as well as everything you need to know about my signature online childbirth education class, the birth preparation course. Again, that's drnicolerankins.com and I will see you next week.